In 1930, 28-year-old Werner Heisenberg wrote an introduction to a book where he boldly stated that the Copenhagen spirit of quantum theory has directed the entire development of modern atomic physics. Soon Heisenberg's term Copenhagen spirit was reframed as the Copenhagen interpretation. And according to Wikipedia, the Copenhagen interpretation is quote, one of the oldest interpretations in quantum mechanics and remains one of the most commonly taught. But what was the Copenhagen spirit? And where did it come from? Aside from Copenhagen, Denmark, of course. This is mostly the story of the friendship between Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. When 20 year old Werner Heisenberg met 36 year old Niels Bohr for the first time, on June 14, 1922, he was so excited he wrote his parents, Bohr is the first scientist who also makes an impression as a human being. He's not just a physicist, but much more. With me, he's always especially nice, and he has invited me to see him once again next week. Heisenberg then quickly finished his PhD in Munich and then got a job as an assistant to the physicist Max Born in Göttingen. Sorry, Born and Bohr sound so similar. At the time, Born was working to try to, quote, find the weak points and contradictions in Bohr's semi-classical theory of atoms. By the end of 1923, Heisenberg had formed a new theory and sent it to his friend Wolfgang Pauli to send it to Niels Bohr. Bohr immediately responded with an invitation to Heisenberg to spend spring break with him in Copenhagen. Wolfgang Pauli was particularly pleased to hear this because he found Heisenberg's theory ugly and without deep connections. And Pauli wrote Bohr, I was therefore very pleased that you had invited him to Copenhagen. Hopefully then Heisenberg will return home with a philosophical orientation to his thinking. In Copenhagen, Heisenberg and Bohr got along like gangbusters, discussing philosophy and physics till midnight every night. Soon Bohr worked out a deal so that Heisenberg could complete his grant with Max Born in pieces. And then Heisenberg spent many months of 1924, 1925 in Copenhagen. When Heisenberg returned to Germany, he used some of the ideas born in his conversations in Copenhagen to come up with a new mathematical model for quantum mechanics, which he gave to his advisor, Max Born. Born then realized this was a math concept called a matrix. And for six months, Heisenberg, Born, and Born's new student, Pasquale Jordan, created a series of papers that are widely considered the beginning of modern quantum mechanics. Although the mathematics were terribly difficult, Bohr was as excited as anyone Although according to Heisenberg, he wasn't very good at math. Bohr was not a mathematically minded man. He was, I would say, a Faraday, but not a Maxwell. As a historian, I like that analogy. Then in January, 1926, Erwin Schrodinger published a wave theory of quantum mechanics. And soon there was a fierce debate between the two methods, which everyone assumed were incompatible. However, by May, both Schrodinger and Wolfgang Pauli proved that they were mathematically equivalent. This gave the advantage to Schrodinger as his math was much easier. And more importantly, people, including Schrodinger himself, held the philosophy that using Schrodinger's theories, quantum mechanics could be made into a branch of classical mechanics. In July, Heisenberg went to a talk by Schrodinger and was told to be quiet as, quote, we are now finished with all that nonsense about quantum jumps. Depressed, Heisenberg wrote Bohr that very night, and Bohr then invited Schrodinger to Denmark to debate the issue. Once in Copenhagen, even Heisenberg was surprised by the ferocity of Bohr's feelings on the issue. Bohr now appeared to me almost as an unrelenting fanatic who was not prepared to make a single concession. It will hardly be possible to convey the intensity of passion with which the discussions were conducted on both sides. It got so intense that when Schrodinger fell ill, Niels Bohr's wife, Margaretha, nursed him while Niels Bohr continued the discussions bedside. Interestingly, 
Schrodinger had a far different view of the encounter. And a few weeks later, he wrote a friend, quote, in spite of all our theoretical points of dispute, the relationship with Bohr and especially Heisenberg was totally cloudlessly amiable and cordial. Schrodinger was also quite surprised and a little bit disappointed to find that someone of Bohr's fame, he described Bohr as being honored almost like a demigod, would be so shy and timid. Quote, Bohr talks often for minutes, almost in a dreamlike, visionary, and really quite unclear manner, partially because he is so full of consideration and constantly hesitates, fearing that the other might take a statement of his point of view as an insufficient appreciation of the other. Despite all the talk, Schrodinger remained unconvinced. Then in October, 1926, Wolfgang Pauli wrote Heisenberg about a strange phenomena. If he used Heisenberg matrices, then the more he studied the position of an electron, then noted with the letter Q, but now used the letter X, then the harder it was to describe the object's momentum or mass times speed, then and now denoted with the letter P. Wolfgang Pauli wrote Heisenberg, one can look at the world with the P eye and one can look at it with a Q eye, but when one would like to open both eyes, then one gets dizzy. In the beginning of 1927, while Bohr was on a ski trip to Norway, Heisenberg realized that he could derive this relationship, which he called the imprecision relation. By mid-March, Bohr returned to Copenhagen and immediately noted problems with some of the concepts, which left Heisenberg in tears. After 10 days that were described as very disagreeable, Heisenberg edited the paper to Bohr's satisfaction and published it on March 22, 1927. Bohr happily then sent copies of the paper to Einstein with a comment that he felt that it, quote, represents a most significant, exceptionally brilliant contribution to the discussion of general problems of quantum theory. Einstein was not impressed. In fact, he hated it with a passion and Einstein debated it with Bohr for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, in about April, 1927, Heisenberg and Bohr were having conflicting arguments about quantum mechanics. Heisenberg recalled, quote, we are unable to find the same language for the interpretation of the theory. Part of it was a question of mathematics. Heisenberg felt that we must realize that our words don't fit. They don't really get a hold in the physical reality and therefore a new mathematical scheme is just as good as anything. Whereas Bohr was determined to make it work outside of mathematical. His biographer wrote that Bohr believed that, quote, our words have to fit, we have nothing else. Bohr's assistant recalled that these disagreements about Heisenberg's work became a source of inspiration and Bohr decided that quantum mechanics needed new words to describe physics that didn't originate in classical theories. According to Bohr's assistant, Bohr dictated and the next day all that he had dictated was discarded and we began anew. And so it went all summer. By July 1927, Bohr published an article originally titled The Philosophical Foundations of Quantum Theory. Ironically, Bohr's devotion to the science of how to communicate quantum mechanics without math was incredibly difficult to follow, especially in the beginning. So I'm going to give you his biographer's paraphrasing of it. The question of whether an electron is a particle or a wave is a sensible question in the classical context where the relation between object of study and detector needs no specification. In quantum mechanics, that question is meaningless, however. There one should rather ask, does the electron or any other object behave like a particle or like a wave? That question is answerable, but only if one specifies the experimental arrangement by means of which one looks at the electron. Bohr called this complementarity, pairs of complementary properties which cannot all be observed or measured simultaneously, like position and momentum or wave versus particle properties. The debates about the uncertainty principle and Bohr's philosophies got so intense that the Solvay Congress decided they could no longer continue their embargo of German scientists and dedicated their entire meeting to the debate. At the conference, Einstein would wake up every morning to give Bohr a new thought experiment that was supposed to disprove uncertainty and Bohr would find a solution by dinner time. Meanwhile, by June 1927, 25-year-old Heisenberg 
was offered a position as a full professor in Leipzig, making him the youngest full professor in Germany. Heisenberg became dedicated to starting a world-class physics program in Leipzig with deep connections to Bohr in Copenhagen and Born in Göttingen. And for a few years, every physicist worth his or her salt learned German and went to Leipzig, Copenhagen, or Göttingen, and usually all three. By 1928, any disagreements between Bohr and Heisenberg were completely passed. Heisenberg wrote Bohr apologizing for his ungrateful behavior. And Bohr replied, rarely have I felt myself in more sincere harmony with any other human being. In February 1932, the English scientist James Chadwick discovered the neutron, which is a heavy, chargeless material found in the nucleus. When Bohr found out about it, he immediately wrote Heisenberg. Here we have become very interested in the neutron problem, whereupon Heisenberg also wrote his own paper on the neutron to, quote, apply quantum mechanics to the nucleus. Bohr's liquid drop model ended up having major implications for the development of quantum mechanics and the development of the nuclear bomb. Heisenberg's theory from this time, as far as I can tell, was discounted pretty quickly as he assumed the neutron was just an electron and proton sort of smushed together, which violated Heisenberg's own uncertainty principle. In January 1933, Heisenberg and Bohr's relationship got much more challenging because Hitler came to power. Heisenberg was convinced he was a flash in the pan and tried to convince all the scientists he could find to stay in Germany, or if they were forced to flee, that it was only a temporary thing and maybe they should just take a leave of absence. Bohr had no such ideas, was very concerned about Hitler, and formed committees which eventually helped over 300 scientists. Years later, Bohr's wife Margaretha recalled, Oh, the 30s were such terrible years. There we nearly collapsed. I remember when we went to America in 33, we had such a long list of people for whom we should try to find places. In addition, Despite the fact that Bohr wasn't at all religious, he had something personal to fear from the Nazis because his mother was Jewish. Despite their differences on politics, Bohr and Heisenberg continued to be very close and visit often. Meanwhile, Heisenberg formed a very, very close relationship with his student, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. And according to Heisenberg, quote, I saw Weizsäcker almost daily during the years 1931 to 1935. For example, in October 1934, Heisenberg wrote his mother that the only way he could understand the rise of Hitler was with the friendship of Carl Frederick, who struggles in his own serious way with the world around us. Heisenberg's relationship with Weizsäcker got a little bit more complicated in 1936, when 34-year-old Heisenberg fell in love with Weizsäcker's 19-year-old sister, Adelaide, and her parents rejected the suit. A few months later, Weizsäcker ended his assistantship with Heisenberg and started an internship with Lisa Meitner in Berlin. Their friendship remained a little distant until 1939, at the start of the war, when Weizsäcker invited Heisenberg to join the Uranium Club to study the military aspects of nuclear fission. Back in 1936, Heisenberg felt very lonely without the young Weizsäcker. But then in January 1937, he met a young woman named Elizabeth Lee Schumacher, and two weeks later they were engaged. Heisenberg wrote Bohr that he would be worried about being a successful scientist and family man if it weren't for the great example of his idol Bohr. After their quick marriage, Heisenberg brought his new bride to Copenhagen to meet Bohr. In Copenhagen, Margaretha Bohr was a bit disturbed by the politics of her husband's protege and his wife. Margaretha took Lee on a private walk away from prying eyes, where there was no fear of being overheard, and said, quote, wouldn't it be nice for you to get rid of this terrible government and get some decent people? To which Lee replied, oh, but what would we do without a Fuhrer? Margaretha recalled, that was the attitude of nice young Germans, so I gave up. As far as I can tell, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg did not see each other for over four years, but the drought ended in September 1941, when Werner Heisenberg went back to Copenhagen and Heisenberg wrote his wife, quote, 
I'm once again in the city where a part of my heart has stayed stuck. But much had changed. Germany had been at war for two years by this time. And although Denmark had tried to stay neutral, they had been occupied by the Germans 16 months earlier. So Heisenberg wasn't just a visitor. He was a representative of a repressive regime that was oppressing their country. This time, Heisenberg's pro-Nazi comments were too prevalent to be ignored by Niels Bohr. And even stranger, Heisenberg told Bohr outright that he was working on nuclear bombs for Hitler. Which brings up the question, why? And that mystery is solved next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. And if you really want to be nice, you can become one of my patrons. Thank you, patrons. There's a link down below. Okay, remember to stay safe and be nice to each other. Have a good day. Which would turn to uh, uh, oppress them about 16 months before as well. Uh, 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 let me do it again. That's good.